Welcome to the Tipping Point Show. I'm Jimmy Evans. I'm so glad that you've joined me today. I've got a very special program. I'm talking about the rapture, and I'm asking the question that I'm going to answer, and that is, is Jesus coming, this Rosh Hashanah that's just coming up in just a few weeks? And so I'm going to te- tell you what I believe, and I'm going to tell you what the Bible has to say, first of all, about the rapture, but also about what the Jews believe about the rapture. I'm also going to be reading an article here in just a second that's absolutely fascinating of something that's happening astronomically this year that is very significant. And I don't know if it's ever happened before, but it's very significant that it's happening this year, especially it's happening during Rosh Hashanah. And so first of all, let me just say, we have our conference this time every year because this is when Rosh Hashanah happens. And so I believe some year Jesus will return on Rosh Hashanah. Now Jesus, the rapture can happen at any time. You know, I don't wanna be dogmatic about anything. Jesus can come at any time, but I'm gonna tell you, what the Jews believe about Rosh Hashanah, what they call Rosh Hashanah. There are many different things that they call Rosh Hashanah. It's a two-day feast that's coming up this year on October 2nd through the 4th. And so I'll be talking about that and just answering the question, is Jesus coming this Rosh Hashanah? What do, what do I believe? Okay, let me first of all say our conference is coming up this weekend, uh, Friday and Saturday, September 20th and 21st. Beginning on Friday night, we'll have worship. And then I'll be up speaking. Uh, When I finish speaking, it's a brand new message I've never brought before. I'm very excited about bringing this message. And when I get finished with my message, I'm going to have a time of prayer. I'm going to lead all of us in prayer, including the people streaming in. And so uh, praying for Israel, praying for our elections, and praying for America. And also praying for everyone in attendance and everyone that's watching on live stream. If you have something in your life that you want God to do. There'll be over 2,000 people at the conference, so a lot of a lot of believers together, and many more watching at home. Many believers agreeing together by faith for God to do a miracle in Israel, in America, and in our upcoming elections, and also in all of our lives. And so it'll be about 10 minutes worth of prayer, whatever, but it's just gonna be a very powerful time. When I finish teaching, Billy Crone will be teaching. He'll be teaching on Friday night and also again on Saturday. David Jeremiah can't be with us this year. I'm very sad to announce that. Love David Jeremiah. He's such a wonderful man. Just circumstances beyond his control. He's not going to be able to be with us. But I'll be there on Friday night. Also on on Saturday, we have uh, Max Lucado. We have uh, myself teaching Saturday morning, Pastor Ed Young. Uh, We have Billy Crone again also in the afternoon. We have uh, Lee Cummings, my dear friend from Michigan. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn will be there. He's always a, a big hit. Every year he'll be there bringing a, a new message. A, a, he's just one of my favorite people to hear. Mark Hitchcock will be teaching on Saturday afternoon. And then we're going to have our panel you know, where we get together. You'll be asked, the people in attendance will be writing in questions to us. And we'll be answering those questions. That, that's how we're going to end the day on Saturday. If you don't have your tickets yet, go to conference.endtimes.com. Uh, We still have some seats available. Go there, conference.endtimes.com. And also you can stream. If you want to watch it at home, you can do that. Just go to conference.endtimes.com, get your live stream or get your tickets. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. So I want to bring this teaching. And first of all, I want to begin with uh, uh, an article. And this article is from Prophecy News Watch. It says, Ring of Fire Rosh Hashanah Eclipse coming in October. And so it's this article, it says, why do solar eclipses keep falling on such noteworthy dates? In 2024, there will be a total of just two solar eclipses. The first happened on April 8, 2024. That was known as the Great American Eclipse of 2024. And it occurred just after the sun had gone down in Israel and the first day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar that had begun. Now that's their religious calendar. So if you remember the eclipse that happened on April the 8th, that happened during the, the religious new year on Israel's calendar. Okay, very interesting. The second solar eclipse of 2024 will take place on October 2nd. When it occurs, the sun will have just gone down in Israel and the festival of Rosh Hashanah will have just started. Is it just a coincidence that the first solar eclipse of 2024 just happened to fall on the very first day of the first month of the Hebrew religious calendar? And the second solar eclipse of 2024 just happens to fall on the day that is celebrated as the Jewish New Year. This is their civil New Year. According to Daily Galaxy, on October 2nd, we will witness a stunning annual solar eclipse. This isn't just any solar eclipse. It's an annual solar eclipse. I'm reading again from this article. As mesmerizing astronomical event is on the horizon as the moon prepares to pass between the Earth and the sun, 
creating a stunning annual solar eclipse, this rare celestial occurrence where the moon is positioned just far enough from the earth to leave a brilliant ring of sunlight visible around its silhouette, promises to captivate sky watchers with its unique and dramatic display. Known as the ring of fire, this phenomenon offers a breathtaking view that differs significantly from a total solar eclipse where the sun is completely obscured. And then I'm skipping down on the second page here. On October 2nd, the sun will go down at 6.22 p.m. in Israel, and that is precisely when the festival of Rosh Hashanah will start. So when this eclipse begins, the festival of Rosh Hashanah will have just commenced. During the fall festivals last year, the current war in the Middle East began when the Hamas terrorists attacked Israel on October 7th. Uh, unlike the Great American Eclipse of 2024, the eclipse of October 2nd will not be visible in the continental United States. Here's another interesting thing. According to Forbes, the be best place to view it will be on Easter Island. And so it's you know, that's interesting that we have two, only two solar eclipses this year on the Earth. And uh, the first happened on the first day of the religious calendar. The second is happening on the first day of their civil calendar. Again, the, you know, this is during Rosh Hashanah. And so, and it's an annual solar eclipse where the sun is not completely obscured. The moon comes between the earth and the sun and you have this brilliant ring of fire around it. And the best place to view it is on Easter Island, you know, the day of the resurrection. And so I, it's, I think it's interesting. Jesus said there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. In other words, in Genesis 1, the Bible says that God created the sun, moon, and stars for signs and for seasons. God speaks to us through signs. The first time Jesus came, remember the, the Magi were led to Jesus by the star. And so there have been significant uh, events, the blood moons, all kinds of events that have been happening that are announcing something. They're announcing the coming of Jesus. And so this is, this is unique. Uh, I don't believe this has ever happened in my lifetime where there's been two solar eclipses on Jewish holy days on and also the New Year, the religious and the civil New Year in Rosh Hashanah. This brilliant annual solar eclipse is going to be happening on Rosh Hashanah. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the rapture. Let me remind you, uh, my daughter and I wrote this book, Where Are the Missing People? And we wrote this for the purpose of leaving these behind. And so I'm, I'm praying that Jesus comes this year. I pray, I pray he comes today. But this is a significant year since last year on October 7th. It's been an incredibly prophetic year and significant year and a year of shaking on the earth. Just what Jesus said would happen. And so we wrote this book to leave behind. And so when we're raptured, people are going to be in our homes. I don't know if you realize that or not, but people, people will be getting into our homes. And so in your home, in your car, in your dorm room, in your apartment, in your office, you can buy one of these books. And we sell these, uh, by the way, we give discounts for more than one because a lot of people buy more than one. And so um, this little book, Where are the Missing People? The Sudden Disappearance of Millions and What Happens Next? When the rapture happens, the number one question on earth is, where are the missing people? This goes into detail about what just happened. The rapture, biblically, what just happened, it leads a person to Christ. If they don't know the Lord, it leads them to the Lord. And it teaches them how to, how to follow the Lord during the upcoming tribulation and things like that. So we wrote this just as if we were leaving it for ourselves if we weren't saved. And so we've sold over 100,000 of these so, so far. And so we want to sell a whole lot more because we want this to be available for people after the rapture, leave it somewhere. Uh, for, and you also buy this for friends and you can give it to them and have them lay it around. But you just lay it in your house or wherever you want to put it so someone can find it after the rapture occurs. It's a very evangelistic thing. It's a very thoughtful thing. Uh, to do for people who are left behind. And so you can go to endtimes.com. You can also buy it on Amazon or you know anywhere where books are sold. Now this, this teaching, I'm asking the question, is Jesus coming this Rosh Hashanah? Remember now the, the eclipse that happened in April. Seven years earlier, there was another uh, eclipse that went all the way across the United States from the East Coast to the West. This one on, our, on, on April 8th went from uh, all the way across the United States from Mexico up through Maine. And so very significant uh, cross, put a cross mark uh, over America through these uh, eclipses. And by the way, the Jews regard blood moons or lunar eclipses uh, to be assigned to them, to the Jews. But solar eclipses are assigned to the world, to the Gentiles. And so there have been very significant uh, eclipses, very significant events that have happened. 
And so a couple of questions. The first is how much longer till the rapture occurs? Now, nothing else has to happen uh, prophetically for the rapture to occur. The rapture can happen right now. They don't have to build the temple until the middle of the tribulation. Uh, the, all those things like that. That, that. They don't have to have the mark of the beast till the middle of the tribulation. And so right now, uh, Jesus can come at any time. So let me first of all talk about the doctrine of the rapture. And again, I just want to be patient in this teaching today. And this is going to go out to everybody. Everybody's going to be able to see this entire teaching. And um, 1 Thessalonians 4 is the clearest explanation of the rapture in the Bible. There are many places the rapture is talked about, but this is the clearest explanation. And this is the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And that's those people who are dead in Christ. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so the two words, English words, caught up, it is one Greek word, harpazo, but it's the Latin word, rapio, or rapturo. Uh, Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, and so it's a, it's a biblical word. Some people say rapture is not in the Bible. Yes, it is. It's in the Latin Bible. It's a biblical word. But the concept means to snatch away, to seize hastily, just to come and take you away. The truth of the rapture is there will be there'll be a generation of people that never die. I believe we're that generation. You know, I believe that many of us that are alive right now will never die. And so the dead in Christ rise first. That means loved ones, believers who are with Jesus right now. When a person dies, they their body is dead here on earth, but their spirit is alive in the presence of Jesus. Christians never die. I don't know if you realize that. Believers never die. The instant that our body goes to sleep here on this earth, what we call death, our spirit is immediately in the presence of Jesus. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so we, we go to paradise and we're there. We don't have our physical bodies yet. The believers who are dead right now, they have their spirit body. The real us is a spirit, by the way. It's not this body. But when Jesus returns, the dead in Christ will rise. The bo their dead bodies, wherever those bodies are, will come out of the grave and be instantly transformed into a body like Jesus has. The 1 Corinthians 15 calls Jesus the first fruits from the dead, that he's the first fruits. And so just as Jesus was resurrected and he came to his disciples and he said, touch me, I'm not a ghost. We're not ghosts when we're in heaven through eternity. We have real bodies and we can eat, we can drink, we can feel, we, have, we feel pleasure, but we never die. We have perfect, eternal bodies, glorious bodies. And that's very good news. And so Jesus said, or Paul says, the dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, will be raptured to meet the Lord in the clouds in the air. He says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so it's very comforting to know with all the stuff that's happening in the world right now, that any moment Jesus can come and rapture us out and we will have our new eternal bodies, never die again, never have pain again, the law, never death anymore. And so very good news. Here's another explanation of the rapture. Again, Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Again, that's talking about the rapture, and when it says in a moment, that's the word atomos in the Greek. It means an indivisible amount of time. So we've got a word atom. In a moment, just immediately, in the twinkling of an eye, we are raptured, and we're changed. And, and just like Jesus, we have the, our new eternal bodies. It says in Luke 17, now this is Jesus describing the rapture. And again, I want to read this very patiently because I want you to see the wording in here, because this is an extremely important text here where Jesus is talking about when he comes back. Okay. And some people say, well, he's going to come at the end of the tribulation or in the middle of the tribulation, whatever. Jesus is very clear about when he's coming back. So this is Luke 17. He, Jesus has been asked, about the signs of his return. 
Jesus said, as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Okay, so let me stop right here. So Jesus is talking about his return. And he's saying it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah, buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, you know, just business as usual kind of period of time. And it says here, until the day, they were given in marriage until the day, the day, he's talking about one day in human history. Okay, He's saying, when I come back, it's going to be like a day, the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. When Noah never had a raindrop on his head. Noah and his family got on the ark when there was buying and selling, marrying, giving in marriage. It was business as usual. Okay, So Jesus is very specific here that he's going to come. His coming will be like the day right before Noah got on the ark or like the day that Noah got on the ark, pre, pre-wrath. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. Listen to this. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, okay, he didn't, he didn't experience any judgment. On the day, a specific day in human history, when Lot went out of Sodom before the judgment, he says, my coming is going to be like that day. When out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. The day, one singular day, he's comparing to the day that Lot went out of Sodom, the day that Noah got on the ark before the flood. Even so, it will be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he was on the housetop, and his goods are in the house. Let him not go down and take them away. And likewise, the one in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two people in one bed. The one will be taken. The other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken. The other left. Two men will be in the field. The one taken. The other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. In other words, up in the sky. Where are they going to be taken? They're going to be taken up there. Well, first of all, see, people say two people, it's talking about two people will be in one bed, one taken, one left. Two men will be in a field, one taken, one left. Understand, when the rapture occurs, it's night on half the earth, it's day on half the earth. And so when the rapture occurs, many people will be in bed sleeping. But a lot of other people will be out working and, and going about their business. And so this is what Jesus is talking about. He's also saying it's a selective rapture. You, you can be laying next to a person in bed and you're taken and they're left behind. Because it all has to do with relationship with Jesus. You, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to go on the rapture. If you don't, you're not going to go on the rapture. It's not about what church you belong to or what you believe. It's about have you received Jesus Christ into your life? Or do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Okay, So it's a selective rapture. But it's a very interesting word here. So he says, one taken, the other left. Okay, so the word taken here is the Greek word paralambano. Okay, here's the importance of that word. By the way, the word paralambano means to receive into yourself. Okay, one taken, I'm going to receive these people to myself, but one's left behind. In John 14, this is where Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to leave and prepare a place for you. And as surely as I go away, I'm going to come back to receive you into myself so that where you are, uh, where I am, you may be also. The word receive, where Jesus said, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself, that is the word paralambano. The exact word Jesus is using here about the rapture. And so the Jesus himself talked about the rapture. And in Matthew 24, Jesus says again, the days of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah before the flood. Okay, He's, I'm coming before the flood. Now there is a rapture at the end of the tribulation. It's also in Matthew 24. Some people get confused by that. It's the only place that a post-tribulation rapture is mentioned. These are for people who got saved during the tribulation. And so when Jesus comes at the end of the tribulation, he, those people are going to be gathered too. This is all talking about a pre-wrath rapture. It happens just like the days of Noah, just like the days of Lot before judgment. We talk about the timing of the rapture for just a minute. So wh- when does the rapture happen? Do we know the timing of the rapture? Well, let me talk about the Feast of Israel because this is where Rosh Hashanah comes in. And they're very significant. Okay, There were seven feasts, Leviticus 23. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. 
Okay, so the word feast is the Hebrew word moed. It just means an appointed festival. But the word convocation is the Hebrew word mikra. It means a public meeting or a dress rehearsal. In other words, these are, these are convocations. Okay, so they had seven feasts, and they were all dress rehearsals graphically demonstrating the future in advance. We absolutely know that the feasts of Israel were prophetic. They, they were telling the future in advance. So there were four spring feasts. There was Passover. Okay. Passover is when Jesus was crucified. Okay. And they would take the, the lamb, the spotless lamb, and they would uh, kill it and its blood. Remember, they did it originally in Egypt. They wiped the blood on the doorpost and the death passed over the Hebrews' homes where the firstborn of Egypt were, were dying. And so Jesus was the lamb uh, of the world. John 1.29 says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus, on, on exactly the day of Passover, Jesus was crucified. Okay? He fulfilled that first feast. Did you know in the Old Testament, when the Jews were keeping the fa uh, Passover uh, uh, feast, they were proclaiming the death of Jesus. They didn't know it, but they were proclaiming the death of Jesus. The second feast that happened right after Passover was unleavened bread. It was a seven-day feast. Unleavened represents sin in the Bible. Jesus was sinless, of course. But seven is significant because it's the number of perfection. Why, why was there, when Jesus was buried, he was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, What's the significance of that? Jesus perfectly removed sin from the human race. Now, it has to be appropriated by our faith in Jesus. Okay, But he, Jesus paid for the sins of the world and his lifeless body laid like unleavened bread in that tomb. He had removed the sin from the world. The next feast was the Feast of First Fruits, the day after the unleavened bread began. The Feast of First Fruits, Jesus was resurrected during the Feast of First Fruits. The priest was waving, the priest would take the barley sheaves, the first fruits barley sheaves, and wave them before the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 50 days after first fruits was the feast of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50, and 50 for the Jews is a number of jubilee, when everybody goes free, freedom, fullness, redemption. The Holy Spirit fell on the upper room on the day of Pentecost, exactly on the day of Pentecost. And this is when the priest would go and wave two loaves of bread before the Lord. And this represents Jews and Gentiles all coming together in Jesus. And so we absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Feast of Israel were prophetic in nature. Okay, so now there were four spring feasts and then there was an interim where there weren't any feasts. Then there were three more feasts in the fall. These have not been fulfilled, but they will be fulfilled in order on the exact day. Okay, in order on the exact day, just the way the first uh, feasts were. Okay, there's gonna be something significant that happens. The next uh, feast is the Feast of Trumpets, which is coming up in October, October 2nd through the 4th. The Feast of Trumpets, I believe, represents the rapture. And I'll tell you in just a minute why I believe that. It starts the 10 days of awe. Okay? It's on the first day of the seventh month, and it's two days long. And that's very significant. The Feast of Trumpets is a two-day long feast. Then after that feast, 10 days later, uh, is the Feast of Atonement. And I believe that uh, is the second coming. It's a very somber day in Israel. It's the holiest day on Israel's calendar. And I believe that the Feast of Trumpets is the rapture. The Feast of Atonement is the second coming when Jesus comes back visibly. The first time, the rapture is a private event between the church and Jesus in the clouds. The second is a very public event where every eye sees him, Zechariah 14, Revelation 19. And then uh, from the 15th to the 22nd day, of the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is where the Jews live in temporary little booths for seven days. And this represents eternity with God. Seven, this is the seventh feast on the seventh month that lasts for seven days, seven, 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 total perfection. This is eternity with Jesus. And so all of these feasts are going to be fulfilled. Uh, and again, I believe that the Feast of Trumpets represents the rapture of the church. Let me, let me tell you some things. First of all, the, the, Feast of Trumpets is connected to, or Rosh Hashanah is connected to trumpets. And almost every scripture that I just read there, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, they all talk about the Jesus is going to come with the trumpet blast at the last trumpet. And so in Revelation chapter 4, 
It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had gowns of gold on their heads. Now, so this is, I heard a voice like a trumpet, sound like a trumpet, come up here, okay? Now, I believe that that represents the rapture. Let me tell you why. In chapters one through three of the uh, book of Revelation, the church is mentioned constantly. In the church, the chapters two and three are the letters to the seven churches, okay? From chapters four to chapters 19, now we see the church in heaven. This is what I believe. And the reason I believe that is, first of all, John said, heard a voice like a trumpet, and you know, I saw a door open, and a voice said, come up here. Okay, So elders are only mentioned related to the church. The Old Testament, they, they weren't elders. Okay, They were patriarchs, whatever they were called. The elders is the Greek word presbyteros. It is a word that refers to New Testament church elders. And so John saw 24 elders sitting around the throne, and they're worshiping the Lamb. And so th I believe that this is, this is the church, again connected with trumpets. So it's very clear from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation chapter 4, and other places that the rapture of the church is connected with the trumpet. And when, by the way, when, when it says at the last trump, the Jews during Rosh Hashanah, they blow the trumpet 100 times. And the last time they blow it is called the last trump. And the priest who's blowing the trumpet blows as loud and long as he can until he runs out of breath. It's the last trump. So when you say the last trump, the Jews understand what that means. The other thing I want to say about the timing of the rapture, I want to go through the other names for the Feast of Trumpets that are very interesting. And this comes from the Mishnah. The Mishnah was written about 200 AD, and it's a record of the oral tradition and oral laws of the Jews up until that time, because they have the written Bible, and they have the Torah, but they also have a, a lot of oral tradition. And remember, they've been keeping the feast for 3,500 years. And so they have many names for the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah. And I want to go through those. Of course, the first is Rosh Hashanah. It's called the head of the year. Okay, this is the beginning of their new year. The Jewish tradition believes that Adam was created from the dirt on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem on, the, on that day. It was the first day of the year. So, and by the way, October 2nd begins the, the Hebrew year 5785. So they believe 5,785 years ago that Adam was created. Okay, it's a new beginning. Trumpets is a new beginning. The Feast of Trumpets is also called Yom Teruah, which means a day of blowing. And it also means the day of the awakening blast. When they blow that trumpet, it's the day of the awakening blast. Remember now, the feast are convocations. They're dress rehearsals. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. It's just, it's very interesting you know, the day of the awakening blast, and twice there we're told that at the trumpet, the dead in Christ are raised. The Jews also, in their oral tradition, refer to the Feast of Trumpets as Yom Hadin, referring to the day of judgment. It's a day of judgment. Second Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. The judgment of unbelievers is the end of the millennium, our judgment as believers is at the beginning of the seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb, and it prepares us to be His unblemished bride. Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter in the Bible, Jesus says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to His work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so we need to understand, and I've said this before, we're saved by grace, but we're judged based on our works. Now, the judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of rewards. Okay, 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that all the things that we've done in this life that aren't good, they're just burned away. They're, they, and it says some people will get to heaven yet as through fire, which means they got to heaven, but they didn't bring much with them because their works weren't good, or they didn't have very many good works, like the thief on the cross next to Jesus. Okay, he got to heaven, but you know he was a thief all of his life. But you still got heaven and you got Jesus, and there's no losers in heaven. 
There are other people who will be fabulously wealthy and rewarded in heaven because of their works on this earth. We're saved by grace. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. But when you get to heaven, everything you've done is going to be brought before you. Again, there's no punishment. Uh, there's just a lack of reward or a reward. And the rewards in heaven are incredible. Uh, eyes not seen, ears not heard, nor is it entered in the heart of man what God has prepared for those who, who love him. And so th for those of us going to heaven, it's going to be incredible. Another saying that the Jews have regarding the Feast of Trumpets is Yom Zikaron, which is the day of remembrance. Okay, The rapture is a selective event. And on the day of the, uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets, the day of the rapture, Jesus is going to remember who belongs to him. One taken, one left behind. Interestingly, the Jews also refer to the Feast of Trumpets as the wedding day of the Messiah. I, I, just, think, I just think that's absolutely fascinating. Also, they call it ha Malek, the season of the coronation of the king. And Jesus is coming. Remember, Revelation 19 is the king of kings and lord of lords. And listen to this one. I love this one. They also refer to the Feast of Trumpets as the day which no one knows. So the two-day two -day feast, if I told you that Jesus was coming during Rosh Hashanah, you still don't know the day or the hour. It's, it's, it's the hidden day. Mark 13, 32, Jesus said, Of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So when a, a Jewish groom came and was betrothed, he brought a bride price to the bride's family, and they were legally betrothed. And then he went back to his father's house and he had to build a, a room for his wife onto his father's house. And when he was finished, the father had to inspect it. And the father then told him when to go back and get his bride. Typically about a year later, he would go back to get his bride, typically at midnight. She didn't know when he was coming. And so she said, I don't know. O only my father knows. Well, it's the day that nobody knows. So that's why it's a two-day feast. That's why that's so interesting. The, another saying the Jews have for the Feast of Trumpets says, the day heaven's door is open to the righteous. Revelation 4, we just read it. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So the feast has to be fulfilled in order. They will be fulfilled in order. And the next feast, the first four spring feasts have already been fulfilled. The next three have not been fulfilled. They have to be fulfilled in order to the day. So the next one coming up is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, from October 2nd to the 4th this year. It begins at sundown. Jewish days begin at sundown, not sunup. Okay, so on October 2nd, at sundown in Israel, Rosh Hashanah begins. Now, I live in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and we're seven hours behind Israel. So I always go by Israel's time. So on October 2nd, it would be about 11 a.m., when I start realizing Rosh Hashanah has begun. When it begins in Israel, it's begun. And so it will last until Friday at about 11 a.m. Okay, so, or sundown, our, our time, but in Israel, it'll be about 11 a.m. So could Jesus come uh, this year during Rosh Hashanah? Well, I never set dates. And, and again, I don't want to be dogmatic and just say Jesus can't come unless he comes on Rosh Hashanah. Jesus can, can come anytime he wants to, and I'm not going to get dogmatic about it, but I'm telling you what I believe. I just told you what the Bible says about the rapture and what Jewish tradition says about the Feast of Trumpets, the, the names that they have for the Feast of Trumpets. I just believe some year Jesus is going to come during Rosh Hashanah. I'm always ready. We always need to be ready. But I am very aware during the Feast of Trumpets that Jesus could come and rapture the church. And I think it's a very exciting thing. Well, well I, do I believe he'll come this year? I sure hope so. There sure has been a lot going on in this last year after October 2nd, uh, 7th. And the two eclipses on the religious new year and the civil new year, very significant. And again, you know, I don't set dates, but I'm, I'm sure looking for Jesus to come this year. I, I really pray he comes this year. There's just not, nothing else has to be happen prophetically. And look what's happening in Israel right now. Surrounded by their enemies, horrible situation with Iran and Turkey and Russia and all the Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis and the terrorists and all the things happening to them there. And there's no solution, just exactly the way the Bible said. There's going to be an answer man step on the scene one of these days, 
And that's the Antichrist. We're living in the world of the Antichrist right now. I believe he's on the earth right now. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. You see, you see the manifestation of the Antichrist spirit like we have never seen it before. And so Jesus is coming soon. I know that. He's coming. He told us he was going to come and come, come to get us. He's at the Father's house preparing a, a place for us. And he's going to come and receive us unto himself. And so my prayer is that he comes this year. I'll be ready this year. If he doesn't come this year, we're going to keep working. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. But my question for you, because this is going to go out to everybody, uh, everybody on YouTube, everybody on our uh, subscribers list, uh, the paid and non-paid. The reason it's going out to everybody is because I just want to make sure that you realize the Bible talks very specifically about the rapture of the church, about it happening in the twinkling of an eye, like the days of Noah, like the days of Lot that we're living in. And the one thing that you have to do to be ready for the rapture is to receive Jesus Christ into your life. Is are you a believer? Have, have you asked Jesus to come in to be your Lord and Savior? Romans 10, 9 says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Okay. Well, when it says when you confess with your mouth, it just means you, you say, Jesus, you're the Lord of my life. I confess you as Lord of my life. I invite you to come in. And Lord means boss. Lord means master. I, I get down off the throne of my heart. And I've done a terrible job leading my own life and being my own God. I repent of that. I invite you to come and be my Lord and Savior. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. Here's the significance of that. There, there are many other so-called saviors that are still rotting in their graves. The, the resurrection of Jesus was God the Father attesting that he accepted the death of Jesus to pay for our sins. And Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God and God. And so... I believe you're the only God. I don't believe you're one of many. I believe you're the only God, and I confess you as my Lord. And if you've never done that before, I just want you, wherever you are right now, I want you to say this prayer with me. And after you say this prayer, you can know that you're a believer. You don't, you don't have to be a good person. You, you can't earn salvation. It's a free gift by grace. And so I want you to say these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to you, and I invite you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and I receive your forgiveness. And I also receive the gift of eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to change and to live for you. I dedicate the rest of my life to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you just prayed that prayer, my encouragement to you is tell someone what you've done. Don't, don't keep it private. Tell someone you need to get baptized. You need to go to church. You need to go to a Bible-believing church that baptizes in water. You need to be baptized. It's a very important act of obedience. You need to get a Bible that you can understand. There are a lot, a lot of good Bibles out there. Get you a Bible. Start reading the Bible. Start in the New Testament. Start reading the Bible. That's how you build a personal relationship with the Lord. And it's very important to be in fellowship with other believers, to find a good Bible-believing church that will help you grow in the Lord. But I want to congratulate you if you just prayed that prayer. If you are already a believer, I'm just saying to all of us, we need to be living for Jesus. The, the day is late. We need to be living for Jesus and knowing He can come at any minute. It's going to be the very best thing that's ever happened. I, I know some people say, well, I want to get married and I want to have kids and all that kind of stuff. I, I completely understand that. But I say, when you see Jesus' face, you'll never look back. There'll, there'll never be any regrets. And this is another thing I want to say before I leave. I tell people this, uh, plan like Jesus isn't coming back for 100 years, but live like he's coming back today. In other words, go on with your life. Don't, don't stop living. You know, the, the worst thing about date setting is that people just stop living. Don't do that. Live your life. Serve the Lord. You know, love your family. You know, have a career. All the things that you uh, want to do, do those things. But understand this live like Jesus is coming back today. And during those two days of Rosh Hashanah, I just have a special awareness of the fact that I can see Jesus at any minute. Okay, So that, that's what I'm doing this year. This is my personal opinion. I believe Jesus will come some year during the Feast of Trumpets, but I'm always ready and he can come anytime he wants to. And I hope this message has been an encouragement to you today. Remind you again of the book, Where are the Missing People? If you don't have one of these, get one of these to leave behind for someone who doesn't know the Lord. You can go to uh, endtimes.com 
When you go on there, you can just click up the left-hand side of the page there at the world, and it'll take you to, you'll see the store there at the top of the page. You can buy one of these. You can buy a number of these. You get uh, on Amazon.com also, but we give discounts for uh, when you buy more than one. Uh, also, it reminds you about the conference that's coming up this weekend. If you don't have your tickets, get your tickets. I would love to see you there. And th- this is going out to everybody. And so this is everybody on YouTube, everybody on our uh, our email list. If you're not uh, a subscriber to endtimes.com, when you subscribe to endtimes.com, you're helping yourself, obviously, to get all of our podcast and information that comes out to keep you up to date on what's happening in the world related to Bible prophecy, but you're also helping to support this ministry uh, going around the world and helping people to know more about Jesus and to tell them about what is happening to comfort them uh, in the world today. So thank you for being a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, go to endtimes.com, $7 a month, $77 a year. You can be a subscriber and also help us to take this ministry to more people. We'll see you at the conference this weekend. Love to see you there. God bless you. Bye-bye.